Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay respects to leaders past, present and emerging. The Understanding Boys podcast is a series of conversations exploring what it is to be a good man these days. So if you had a story about being a good man and that you could tell a 14-year-old boy and he'd actually listen, what would that story be? And that's really what I'm asking our guests today. I'm Dr. Ray Swan, and we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys in the modern world. The series is brought to you by Brighton Grammar, an all-boys school in Melbourne. To learn more about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. In our podcast today, we speak with Lisa McCune. Lisa is an award-winning actor whose performances span three decades and encompass gold, logies, numerous performing arts prizes, and a number of iconic roles on both stage and screen. She's also the devoted mother of three teenage children. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. And as you can hear, you know, being in a school, there's a bit of chatter outside, um, but we won't let that... It's a great um, sound. <laughs> <laughs> we won't let that distract us. Um, one of the things I was really keen to ask you about was just a little bit about your story. Um, you know, we are chatting earlier about getting involved at WAPA at 16 and, you know, I was just really curious to hear from you. What, what was it in you that, from that vocational sense of, like, this is what, I, what I'm here to do, how, how did you know that that was what you wanted to do? It's really funny when people talk about a calling, isn't it? Because, I, you know, for me, there was such a strong sense of, of wanting to not necessarily perform, but it just it kind of felt the most comfortable place for me to be, surrounded by music and words and and stories, particularly stories. It just it just felt safe, and the people that that I surrounded myself. I was lucky enough to audition for the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts, and you know, there's not only the business management side of the arts but and media um, studies. That there was um, theatrical studies, there was musical theatre, and, and also the conservatorium. So I got to explore life in the conservatorium by doing some operas because I was singing and then I did the musical theatre pieces and I'd get there at seven in the morning and I'd leave at nine at night and I had my part-time jobs on the Big side days. and it never felt too much you know it just because I'd found my place and maybe that's what the teenage years are for is exploration and there was a period in my early teens where I wanted to hang out with my high school friends and so all that performing I put to the side because and I played sport and I you know, that became the most important thing for me but then I just slowly swung back and it was just like I, I couldn't get away from it. Right, it was like that, the true me. line that you needed yeah. to... Yeah, but, uh, but interestingly there were a couple of key indicators that were there that and, and things that happened to me along the way um, mm -hmm. and I think that that is... I guess what I'd love to talk to you today about too is mentorship and finding those people that identify something in you and actually expressing it to you so it carries you through because I, I'll tell you a very quick story if you don't mind because I think ahead. it is That's important for here. kids you yeah, know? Absolutely. and it's good for us as adults to make yeah. sure we pass on information to kids. I kind of stopped to do play sport and then I thought oh I might go and do a show and I auditioned for a, a local repertories production of The Wizard of Oz, I got the lead role. I think I was of course. 14. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I did the summer over the rainbow. <laughs> I wasn't that great, really. Um, but we, it was out in the suburbs of Perth, and then we were invited as a, as a group to come together to do this night performing at the Playhouse Theatre. It was kind of going into the big smoke of Perth, and this big night where all the local theatre companies came together. And they asked, said, would you sing Sound of Music? And I did. It was at the end of the show. Right. And that night in the audience um, was a beautiful man by the name of Dr. Geoffrey Gibbs, and he was the dean of of Whopper mm -hmm. and at the end of the night he got up on stage to say his thank yous and he said oh and that that little girl that sang at the end I'd like her to come and see me at the end of the night I want to talk to her about my school and um so it was a quite quite a quick audition in a sense well the, yeah the, it, it planted a seed in my mind and and it became the place I wanted to go I put it on the radar and that one comment um it was enough to drive me to have a passion and a desire to do something and I started working really hard after that and that's now as an adult I remember that story because I am very quick to tell kids about opportunities or to hook them up with people or if they ask me for advice I, I try to connect them in whatever way I can because we forget as adults how how important our words are and mm. how they mean so much to a teenager particularly one, ones that are, that are hungry to know Very where they're going. Very impressionable age isn't it I often find 
um, with the boys I work with, absolutely. You know, you can yeah. say something and you can really see, it can really have a profound, mm. almost an immediate um, uh, profound impact. Yeah, good or bad it. though good too. Bad. And yeah. I think a lot of us sometimes carry some of those things that an adult or a For teacher sure. might have said in passing and it can actually deter us from so much. So we, we, we have to be mindful, yeah. don't we? And, but yeah. mentorship is... Um, you know that that old work experience thing too of sending kids off on work experience. I think is really important. So, do you think it was in the moment that you were like you know people talk about opportunity and preparation? Mm. You know, luck being opportunity and preparation. So you're there, you're on the stage, you've done some work, you've done some training, you rehearsed, and you're ready to go. And then this opportunity presents itself. I mean, is there a lesson in being ready, or is it just more about? Is is there a sense in which? young people need to be ready to hear things or have a, a, a an openness, uh, I guess, in, in terms of listening to the older generation? Yeah, I, it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? As parents, do we lead our children to try lots of things? Do we offer them up opportunities? Do we take them to things? Um, I don't know the answer because I don't know at what point something flicks in us as human beings to, to, to say, that's what I want to pursue. The hard work doesn't seem like hard work when you love it. You know? mm. I mean, I remember my singing teacher, This pri- I went to a private singing teacher from about the age of 14 to do classical voice. And she would say to me, Lisa, she, she was in a huge influence on me because every week, you know, she was giving me great material. We were starting to do, you know, lots of, some really interesting um, music and it was tricky material. And, but she believed in me and probably more so than I did in myself. Mm. But um, sometimes I didn't work hard enough. I could have worked a lot harder. Oh but I did my prep for coming out of year 12 to audition for the academy and um, didn't, didn't really think that I'd get in, but, but I did. And I, I'd guess all of those incremental things that my mum had taken me to over the years had given me enough fuel to get over the line. So my friend Arno Rubenstein, he, in his mm. Rites of Passage framework, he talks about the importance of you know kids having a vision and seeing something, but then also I think of adults seeing that genius or vision in the child as yeah. well and, and sort of I think there's that magic moment where you know it's a great image you're on stage and you can kind of looking out at this future and then mm. someone else sees that through you oh. and that moment comes together and that really yeah. is the power of yeah of and, mentoring. And, it, oh, and it is it's just the most wonderful thing I think that's something that maybe we need to swing back to really focusing on you know to, to create like a register where you know people who are able and they can offer kids opportunities just so they can try it because that opportunity to try is where we're going to see progress progress I think you know I had a, a situation with my son recently so Arch is uh, 17 and a half, he is in year 11. Arch is not really as interested in the arts as I am, but he's got a terrific science brain. And I, we were talking about physics one day, and I found out that he'd actually been reading physics books before he went to bed. Shock horror! I know, and I was like, physics? Where did that come from? I mean, he used to love magnets. Put those away and immediately, yeah. yeah. And I just thought, wow. And, and he said he's been reading physics books and reading online at night and, and all of that stuff. And I thought, wow, that's so cool. Yeah. And then through one of his teachers, um, I somehow made connection via another teacher's father. And so he's been now emailing, asking all these crazy big questions that he hasn't been able to find answers to and that are so big for his brain. And he's been getting having this email correspondence that's with fantastic. a professor. I mean, that stuff's cool. And it's outside. I mean, you know, and others, something else I heard yesterday, we had our final day for mm. the boys leaving and going to a really big transition. Mm. And a PE teacher here, James Gertzman, has a quote, the magic happens outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, and absolutely. And I thought, oh, wow, what a great, what a great one. Oh, it's so true. I think every, you know, for me speaking personally, everything that has happened that's been great in my life has been because an opportunity was given to me and I, and I took it and it was really scary. Not once was it easy. You know, so now I even kind of at 47, I keep thinking, Wow, the kids are still doing it. I've got to take a risk, and you know, in a very public way. Unfortunately, sometimes for right. us as performers as well, yeah. because when you fall on your face at forty-seven, it's really crap. Yeah. It is at any age, but when you get older, you kind of hope to do it with a bit of grace. But you just don't. <laughs> yeah. And but you've got to fall on your face. And I, I now collect quotes. I've got a page on Pinterest, and I just it's full of quotes. And I, at the end of this podcast, I'm going to find it and give it to you because it's the it's a cool quote about how. A huge percentage of the population basically don't know what they're good at. 
Right. And that's because I don't think they found it in their teenage years yeah. and perhaps that's the time. That's the time. When we need to, to ignite and yeah. to, to flick that switch. Because you've got everything going on and, you know, it's interesting, one yeah. of the things in these conversations that comes up is it's a fought time and it's such a strong developmental time but it's mm. also such a time of pure gold when you can oh. really find... You know, and you see these kids and they make amazing things. They're just limitless with mm. possibilities and beauty. It's a full sort of image of Apollo, you know, the great yeah. athlete and the musician. Anything, like, it's extraordinary. And it is, and maybe that's why two things like um, social media and, and, and all of these things that go on for teenagers now, is that shutting the ability of freedom down for them because they're being judged on the outside. If we can somehow remove that from the equation so when they want to try something, they can do it fearlessly. Because I guess in our generation, we could to a degree, you know, and we could do it quietly and privately, whereas now maybe failure's too great and I think you also uh, yeah you got the, it's like a loaded gun in terms of this is it and mm. this is your one shot and then and it's repeated ad nauseum and I think the other thing that's really tricky for um, adolescents these days is you see so many examples of people that are just incredibly amazing mm. I can remember you know I used to go to the library and read the Guinness Book of Records and see the tallest person or the you know thinking yeah. that was amazing but mm. the news feeds are full of People doing incredible things and people doing terrible things. When for most of us, mm. we kind of live somewhere in the middle in a lot of areas. You know, we might be good at one thing or another, but the rest of it's really it's just hard work. Yeah, it is hard, and I and I love reading. I love biographies. I love reading about people and how they achieved this. And it's interesting that quite often it's the people that have gone through the hardest journeys that have kind of gone on to the greatest successes. You know, they've had a lot of obstacles in the way, and they've actually had to kind of move around them or find I guess arm themselves with the skills and the knowledge and um, and the passion behind it to drive them forward usually there's somebody that believed in them too you know like finding that person to believe in them and and take them that extra mile and that's why teachers are so important I mean I I, I had to answer a questionnaire yesterday of you know who are the people you most admire and my first reaction was teachers and I answered it as honestly and as quickly as I could so I didn't have time to ponder or think and it was teachers and parents and carers and old people because I, I think that they you know are so important in the, in the in the minds and lives of our youth and that's kind of where it's at. So I want to take you back to you know you're talking about like the challenge mm. you know and that you, you developed most under pressure Mm. You know, pressure builds performance and what, what's the role as a mum you know with your boys in that space you know like like we spend so much time and I was a dad I spent a lot of time alleviating trying to make things easier or presenting less choices but you know we're doing our kids a, you know particularly for boys we're doing them a disservice by making it too easy do we need to give them more challenge it's really interesting because I, I think as a mum I try to be the best mum I possibly can so I'm kind of competing with myself but then overdo it and rob my kids of the opportunity sometimes of um, maybe not coming out on top of actually knowing what it is like to fall because uh, you know you're there stacking it and now as I've got a teenage son who's 17 and a half I do want to see him succeed but it's funny now as he approaches his last two years of school I've thought and I've said to him I've got to ease off now he gave me the cues and <laughs> I suddenly realized that this is his journey now and I've provided the best I can but I can't prop him up anymore I can't I've got to stop trying to, and he actually doesn't want me to anymore. It's his journey from here on in. It's great you've got the dialogue that you can do that. You know, you set that up at it's some point. It's not as nice as the dialogue we're having <laughs> now when we're having it at home, believe me. But what I say to, to him particularly, because he's the oldest, is, you know, just you know, try and stay fit because it helps you mentally and, you know, those and have conversations. And the, the role of women in his life is really important but he has for the last few years I've seen the significance of male role models for him and, that, and I was particularly mindful of that when I looked at schools for Archer because I, I wanted him to have good role models you know men who loved learning who created good space for learning I think that um, and having men that talk and I, and I love the fact that you've that you guys are so involved um, as a school with Arnie Rubenstein because I, I read his book many years ago and I loved the fact that um, men do talk and it's it's a powerful thing and if we can actually look after the mental health of men um, it only makes the relationship between men and women better and then less we, we hopefully that that blurred kind of period that these boys seem to be going through now I, I they must be a bit confused yeah I agree and it's I think hard. that that's it is harder I think 
you know, one of the things that we see a lot is men behaving really poorly. And we're talking before about the extremes of behaviour. Mm. I worry as a dad and as a teacher about just the constant barrage of... And, and look, you know, we've got to deal with it. Like, it's mm. a problem societally, you know, patriarchal views have, have been problematic in a whole lot of ways, you know. Um, yeah, but yet, yeah, some, somehow recognising that maybe there are some male traits that are also really fantastic and we're celebrating totally. that, that are, you know, there's this kind yeah. of thing that happens um, and how we kind of balance that out. I, I, I'm curious to know in your work being in, in the performing arts, I mean, mm. how's that, have you sort of seen that played out? Gosh, they, I'd love to do a whole afternoon talking with a group of people about this because um, having two boys, I'm really mindful of it. I'm really mindful. But it, for me in the arts, I've had, I, I think I've had the most, I've had a charmed run. I've never had an incident where I would complain about another performer. I found everybody totally respectful. Things do get really out of hand when there's a lot of adrenaline and you're performing and things, and it's an environment that's full of... Um, you know, a, a lot of overexcited kind of teenage behaviour sometimes, and it, and it is. But I, I never, I've never experienced it to a degree where it's ever been a, a problem. There's been, there's always, there's, the arts is well known for having a lot of um, issues with mental illness and people that struggle with anxiety and lots of that. And but we're also quite, we're quite good at looking after our own. I think we we're very mindful of each other, and I think that things are dealt with hopefully in a really um, in a, in a good way and, and and you've got to speak up a little bit for yourself as well but when you're young you don't and I know that I would never have probably done that I would have been more likely just to remove myself from a situation if, if it was all possible because building you know boundaries is um, you know that's a part of it as well you know and boundaries particularly I guess in a, a world like the performing arts where you know you're ex- you know under pressure and long seasons would also I guess become an area which would be susceptible I suppose as we've Mm. seen. I think you're so kind of wrapped up in trying to find um, your your self-confidence to kind of perform and you're not in that headspace of of anything else until you actually reach performance stage you know that rehearsal period or I was saying to somebody you know when you're going out to do a big musical and you've got you know a 10 million dollar investment on your shoulders there's not just you know your performance at stake there's actually millions of dollars and livelihoods of producers that have taken risks on you and you know when you sit and break it down it's it's huge yeah massively stressful you can't think about it sometimes you actually just got to stay you know true and and kind of pinpoint what your focus is but you are part of a big wheel and I think it's like most professions I mean really it doesn't matter how successful you are you're part of a bigger picture and you're we we all are and we and that's what's great about getting older is you start to realize that you're part of something bigger Mm. Mm. Let me take you back a little bit in in terms of your career. One one of the things I think is fascinating, something I'm interested in for boys in particular, and I think it's so important that boys have exposure to the performing arts and mm. that they learn through not you know seeing rehearsal and time and motivation and all those things lead to great things. It's a mm. beautiful thing to see on stage, but then there's also the bit which is just being in it and learning by doing and mm. okay if you were you know building empathy like if you were Shylock and this happened then what would that be like or if you were confronted with this what would you do mm. um, a, a really powerful example so I really wanted to hear from you with some of the seasons that you've run what have you learned what is that what has the text taught you in oh. terms of where you've come from is it something that jumps out we, we were talking about words just before, before actually, you know, during a break in, in our conversation now, but recently I did a, a play by a new, a, a new American um, playwright, well, young, he's not new, um, Brandon Jacob Jenkins, and he wrote a piece called Gloria when he was in his late 20s. And it's an incredible piece because it's so layered. An event happens, it's quite violent, and so on the surface it's this kind of comedy with this, but yet it's incredibly dramatic. But the underlying piece, when you start to tear it apart, he's made some incredible observations about society and where we're going. And you, you people couldn't help but leave that, that play and go, what was that about? Wow, what happened then? Why were they doing that? Oh, that's why they behave like that. And, you know, that thing of theatre being a mirror that we hold up to ourselves, it really is. Um, and Shakespeare did it too. I mean, really, we look at our own behaviour through his characters and, you know, there's elements and there's um, facets of all of our personalities with, within these characters on stage. It's a real chicken and egg, isn't it? Uh, Harold Bloom, the uh, American... 
critic and writer you know, has that book about Shakespeare, the inventor. I think it's called something like Shakespeare, the inventor of the human consciousness. <laughs> and he sort of says all the maps of, of ways of being are really set in that Elizabethan world. And it's hard to kind of notice, but you can think, I mean, how do, you know, how do we think that first or do we, does that resonate with us because of, um, you know, we are ex- actually merely just experiencing a character that has kind of gone before on yeah, some level. Yeah, it's... I, the one thing that is really interesting when we talk about characters and when I rehearse a play I find really interesting because we'll quite often sit down and talk about a play for a week and a half before we stand up and rehearse it. And we did that with Gloria because there was so much to unpack. And um, but, but isn't it like life when you sit down and you look at a play and you see how an inciting incident will happen to a character therefore changing how they react to the next thing that's about to happen in their life. That does happen to us in real life. Mm. You know, we we wake up in the morning, the first bit of news we see on the television will inform our day or the first thing our child says to us or everything is is kind of cause and effect and we go through life and there's therefore no two pattern of human beha- no two patterns of human behavior in any single human they're, they're just not the same mm. you know nobody's path is exactly the same as anybody's out anybody else's because of what happens to us one of the things they talk about in the mindfulness we teach mindfulness here mm. and one of the things they talk about in that is that being aware of your state and how it impacts on your mm. action as well and that interrelated to being able to observe yeah. where you're at do, I mean do you approach your roles in a do you sort of come in come at it from a sort of fairly neutral state and then build or are you sort yeah. of aware yeah I do it's, it's really interesting and it, I'll approach things differently depending on whether it's a straight play or whether it's a musical I love Search like I'll just do so much reading. I'll find things that are so random that might inform it, and then I actually start building um, things for myself um, visually. I'm, I'm very visual, and so I'll find photographs that might inform me. And as I was saying earlier, I love quotes. I think that I'll find, you know, I'll even sometimes I even had, I even started writing how I thought that person would write one time with a role. I, there was there was one time I was developing things. So it, it does change, but it is it's it's the research that we do in the arts or in theatre that I guess it, people in other um, disciplines and other professions they will do similar kinds of research. Like if you're doing a building, you'll be looking at the different soil that you're building on, or Absolutely. you know, is it a, you know, do they get earthquakes here or whatever? I mean, that's kind of what theatre is. It's just a different. It's just a different It's multidimensional place. though, isn't it? I mean, I was thinking as you were talking as well about um, Charles Dickens, who, mm. when he wrote, apparently he had a little mirror on his on his desk and he'd turn to the mirror and, you know, he'd play old Maddich or he'd play whoever into the mirror and then he'd sort of channel the, wow. the character and then he'd write, furiously so he write it all out. Well. well, he must have been on yeah, some level. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I wonder, are we all, you know, are all, all kids on some level, you know, imitators and... Yeah. I think we all do a little bit of it every day, don't we? Before we go out the door and the way we greet people in a, you know, the way that, you know, you, for example, would have to greet different people during your day. And, mm-hmm. you know, if, if, you know, the way I am as a parent, I said to my kids the other day, do you guys really think that I am this much of a hard ass <laughs> in real life? Do you really think that I go around to other people and say, can you please go and tidy up your bedroom? <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm actually really nice. <laughs> but yeah, we have our different faces and um, I, you know, that's been my quest, I guess, for the last five years. I've actually been hunting for maybe, maybe a bit screwed up after playing too many characters, but I've actually just been really searching for the authentic person in me. Like, what is... I've become more neutral so I can build all of this random madness for characters <laughs> on top. I don't know. Where do you see it? I think that it was the Polish director, Jerzy Grotowski, that said... Someone said to him, be yourself. And he said, well, that's fine, but what self or which self yeah. rather do you want? Yeah. Like, which one? Yeah, yeah, it's really... Yeah, it's a, it's a confusing headspace. That's why I love being a mother because I can't think of anything that normalises me more than my children. And it's the most, and they have a- absolutely shifted my focus into what life is about and what I want for them and what I want their path to be. And people will often say, Oh, do you want your kids to go into the arts? And I, I never breathe a word of it to my children because they, they've got to find their own path. Interestingly, some of their friends come to me because, particularly one who is, I think, super talented. and they've discovered it you know and so i watch his passion and it's just huge mm. it's really exciting and, and the way he's immersing himself is exactly the way i did it interestingly beautiful mm.
One of the things um, we ask in this podcast is about being a good man these days. Mm. And, you know, we talk a bit about needing to tell more stories about that and just providing countermeasures to a lot of the, uh, at times, negative information that we get about being a man. I mean, broad, again, it's a broad question, but what is it to be a good man these days? I I think being a good man I, is, is happiness, is finding the time to actually be able to check in with yourself and know um, what's, what's your agenda and what you want and being respectful of people. I think the more educated you can make yourself makes you a good man because and surrounding yourself with good men, I think that that kind of behaviour just melts onto other men when when they're around good good people. Yeah, it's like a, um, it has a kind of um, elevating kind of... Yeah. Is that what you mean? So yeah. you're with other good people who are like in the yeah. former community around mm. those things. I mean, sometimes people talk about, you know, being values. I mean, it's probably... It's almost a cliche now, being values driven. But I mean, does that resonate with you, the idea that you know what, at the end of the day, as long as I'm guided by a, a set of values that I hold true to and I maintain my integrity with those I know, values. I but we step outside of our own values sometimes and I think that, that we make mistakes and we learn from them and we and we have to. And, you know, I, I think that acknowledging mistakes in a, in a brave way, I think that so many bad mistakes are made out of fear and I can see that there's a lot of fear in young men. and. You know, we've got, to, we've got to let them off the hook a little bit too at a certain age, you know, just to say that's a mistake. And I think that's where having mentors is a really great, great, um, you know, just even on a personal level, having that one person who you can go to and go, oh, I did this, I'm mucked up. I, you know, it's just knowing just takes that the pressure out of the system a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. And, you know, we know to learn you've got to be, yeah. tr- you know, you've got to have trust and you've got to feel comfortable. Mm. And, you know, you, like you were saying, I think, Having a sense of purpose, so all these things lead to. Oh, having a sense of purpose is a big one, isn't yeah. it? You know, like we, there's knowing what we, what is, what is it driving us every day we get out of bed. I sometimes say to my kids, you know, what, what, what is the thing that makes you get up in the morning and makes you want to go out the door? Is it what is driving us, <laughs> or who is driving us to school? Is that <laughs> oh, yeah. how it works? Yeah, that that happens too. But oh gosh, the answers. I mean, I don't think that there is any. Um, I don't think any human can have a set. Um, chart that's going to make them into um, a happy human I just think I think spending time on your own is really important I think we try to cram our kids with you know every opportunity but that perhaps sometimes they don't have that time to breathe my mum said to me a great thing when I had the kids when they were really young she said to me I kept, I said to her one day I just don't know what to do with the kids today and she said Lisa sometimes they have to be bored to discover that what's yeah. what's going to make them happy this afternoon and she was so right you know because leave people alone long enough and they'll find something to yeah, do they'll necessity find. is the mother of invention yeah isn't it? but we want to we want answers for everything now we want to tick boxes we want we're not going to make everybody happy all of the time are we there's there's just you're just not and you but you don't want to read about it on Twitter. When I've written the things about myself on Twitter, I just go, oh, my God, that is so cruel. It's mean. Wow. You know, you really... You, we shouldn't, as humans, have to deal with that stuff. I mean, I mean, I guess I work in the public arena, so you've got to get used to it. People are going to have a go at you, and I hate that side of it. But living your everyday life, that's not fair. That stuff is not fair. You should not write that about anybody else, and you shouldn't have to read it about yourself, I don't think. It's, it's a, such a lack of leadership in our culture at the moment oh. around that, isn't it? I mean, the fact that people can virtually get up, I mean, quite literally, actually, get up and write any manner of opinion. Mm. I mean, it's been a bit of erosion in, in yeah. uh, what would you call it? I mean, is it integrity or is it, is it a, a sense of just common decency that, you know, people under the veil of anonymity that you can pretty much get and up and say And that's the part that I find really gullus is the anonymity. The yeah. number of times I've wanted to fire back at things, um, and, I, and I'm not a big social media user, I'll use it to check um, things if I'm performing in them just to see what's being said because it's a great way to have a yeah. response. We used to write letters, that's not happening much anymore. And um, and when you do check in with it, sometimes you go, oh my gosh, how can you, it, you know, you really, it's, it's how can somebody sit down and take time out of their day to write things? And to me that just shows actually lack of purpose and too much time on your hands to be able to sit and to, to be able to, have that time and yeah, yeah. and even the inclination. I mean, and and I guess you know, in terms of with your, you know, with the boys. I mean, do you, mm. do you is that a conversation that you have about separating the the person from the action or dealing with 
challenge? Is that something that you, you've had experience in talking to your sons about? Um, I think mm. the boys are just so des- I think they're still sort of struggling trying to organise <laughs> the next train to catch. They, they really can spend, you know, it's quite funny observing how um, they can be on social media or whatever they're messaging for about two hours just to organise a trip to town. It takes that long <laughs> to get it together. Rather than someone just saying, hey, meet here at eight, and then that being Meet under the clocks. It goes around and that around. That was the old days of being a yeah. Victorian. Um, I'm not sure if that was in your time being over here, but it was, you know, meet you under the clocks at Flint Street at That's whatever. so cool. That and then that it. was done. That was it. There was yeah. one call. Yep. Or it was a conversation three mm. days ago on mm. Saturday. I was, there was nothing else. But I came recently to um, a school. Um, Michael Carr Gregg spoke, and he he's terrific. I go. I love going and seeing psychologists speak about teenagers, and you know all the things that I know that BGS put on. They're, they're brilliant. I try to go to as many as I can, and he's great. You know, when he talks about it, he said we can't. You know, he he doesn't. Um, he tries not to hate it. He tries to use technology in a good way. And he's, I mean, we can't fight it. We can we, really? I mean, unless you send them away, um, you you can't, can't stop it. You've got to find a way to actually make it, I always say to the boys, you know, use things for, you know, for good, not evil. Mm. You know, yeah. it's just, they're, they're pretty good. I think they know what's right and wrong. They know that the comeback's pretty huge if you really muck up. Yeah, it can be devastating, and I think it's sometimes. I mean, it's a as an educator again. You know, you, when you're working with these kids, boys or girls, and they make mistakes, and the you know obviously the consequence of the mistake is really important that they understand that, and that and that obviously there's a there's a we need to understand what consequences are in life, yeah. but then also we need to learn a bit about why it was wrong and and what were some of the precursor. Mm precursors to it happening and what are some of the triggers and how did you get there and but if all the new research is right and saying that we're teenagers until the age of 22 or 23 these kids and when they're in even in upper school in high school yeah. they've got a long way to go they're going to go make mistakes all the way through university and i i am a big believer in um you know if you make a mistake you, you stay you stand your ground you own up to it and then t- tell others not to do it yeah i mean i think that 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 is the best I don't, know, I don't know. I'm learning as a parent. I still haven't got my. Haven't got, all, haven't got an answer. I haven't got answers for anything. You've got the perfect <laughs> character created, the perfect mother character. I know, <laughs> but I do. You know, the one thing that I actually do as a parent is if I find um, I love chatting to parents that have been through it. I will sit down. I quite often they'll actually say, "I don't remember," and they don't because they've moved through it. But I do love talking to older people about life in general because they're in a relaxed place and they've got wise words and they're oh, a generation sure. that we're not kind of maybe leaning on enough and they want to be lent on yeah and i sometimes wonder you know that's the old thing what is old is new or what is new is old um mm. either way about that idea that i think it's a platonic idea of you know that um everything really is memory and we're just really rediscovering mm. knowledge and that how that kind of works in a community I mean, um, is it survival of the fittest in teenage years? Is that kind of why <laughs> you don't see these eighty-year-olds sitting around texting nasty things no, about each other? Do no, well, we don't. Oh, do we? I don't know. Maybe, maybe they do. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> but maybe you know, just give it time, Lisa. Maybe yeah, it's coming. But you know, it is. It's kind of their. I guess it's their their survival. I don't know. I can't remember. I'm glad it wasn't around when I was. You know. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think of some of the you know the potential uh, things that could have happened yeah. uh, and that do happen. And, and I think this is why there's a, there's a sort of a a note of warning in the sense of, you know, be, be, don't be so quick to judge sometimes. You mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. I see these kids and they're really, really upset. They really don't, they just genuinely don't understand what, what, they get it on a surface level. They go, yeah, I shouldn't have, I get it, I should that was, you know, objectifying or denigrating or whatever it is. And by saying whatever, I don't in any way mean to um, diminish the, the terrible devastation uh, that can happen with the online bit. But I think there's also, as parents and, and as teachers and just to, as a culture, we need to also help people learn, like because mm-hmm. that's really where the the evolution and the development is going to come. And, and that you know, and talks about the idea of self-regulating. That and when you really start to understand, like that's when the learning happens. And you can't learn if you mm-hmm. if you're just scared and if you're just afraid. And you know, it's part of my worry. I think for young men in this era, a bit is that you know, I, I see a lot of it. You know, that I know uncertainty about what to say or how to be or um, and I'm not saying mm. it's, uh, it's alone to any of the genders but but particularly with the, the boys that oh, I'm I seeing. think that when what they're seeing with the media at the moment yeah. is terrifying I kind of think to myself 
yeah. you know, when does he feel like he can, you know, give a girl a kiss goodnight? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, it's all that stuff that I, I'm glad that I'm not there and I can't, he doesn't want to talk to me about it. Yeah. So, because as actors, we sit around and we talk about this stuff for days. So yeah. I feel like I have kind of inbuilt psychology when yeah, I go right. to work. But, yeah. you know, I mean, that was the one thing that I, I when you were talking yesterday, uh, talking earlier before about yesterday at school and sending the year 12 boys off. And the the one thing that I love is, is holding on to those traditions and those you know, it's, it is like that thing, celebrating birthdays, celebrating my events. You know, it is, it's, they're really important markers in our lives. And, and I, I ignored that for many years. I thought, I don't need to have a 30th birthday, I don't need to, but, but we actually do. We do. And I think that they give um, group, human groups a, um, a, a time and a place. And, um, you know, and they somehow mark our maturity as we go as well. And it was a beautiful moment seeing all those. I, I, nothing thrills me more than coming and even more so than than sometimes with my daughter who goes to a, f a girls school is coming and seeing all of these young men and them being told off in church for making too much noise because they're over enthusiastic and you know I and I but I, I love it I love their energy and I love their sense of fun and I love seeing that carry into manhood that's what I that's what I love about men is I love that I love the boyish quality that they hold on to it's just if it's used in the right way, it's the most, it's it's a powerful, wonderful thing. It is. It's a beautiful Rumi poem about, a, I think it's called About the Boy, and it, it, it opens with something like, you know, has anyone seen the round-faced merry trickster of the boy with a bit of string in his pocket and a, and a whistle? Yeah. And, you know, just this kind of funny, um, you know, something that's is something unique about, you know, boys when they're together that is... Um, it's quite remarkable, I agree. Mm -hmm. To that end, you know, and probably my final question um, is around the, uh, the idea if you had a story that you could share with a boy and he'd listen, that he wasn't too busy, you know, texting and trying to work out transportation arrangements and he'd listen. Um, what would it be? And, and if there's no story, that's okay. I mean, what, what are some of the, just I guess, the important messages for, for young adolescent males these days? I, uh, is it, it when I'm with the boys and it's usually in the car there's quite often a story that will come up and I always you know give them or share some of my stories which you know they're from a female perspective they are very different a lot of my stories involve men who've been very good to me in my life and my career and most of them have been there's been you know one f very significant female in my life apart from my mother but um, most of them have been good men and they have been so good to me in many ways. And I guess not. I guess my Je Dr. Jeffrey Gibbs story that I told earlier is that one thing of you know always listen for that that person that's giving you a signpost and take it. And just yeah, I, I, I haven't got a specific story. I wish I did because I have so many little ones. Um, another thing that Arch told me one day was that. Um, you know, recently when he was talking about studying for his exams, and I, I quite often listen to their stories more because I think that they're really insightful and they're, they're telling me things about themselves that um, they don't want to kind of utter just in everyday conversation. But when Arch said to me, he's doing a year 12 subject in year 11, and I said, oh, we'll, we'll sit down and we'll go through some of the stuff. And he said, oh, he said, it's better when I teach you. And I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? And yeah. I quite often think that, um, you know, he just said it's better I can if I can teach you mum then I know that I know it and I thought wow isn't that that's Amazing. such an insightful way of understanding something and I'd heard an, a, a podcast with Oprah saying that she actually wanted to teach and I thought that's why she's a good communicator because yeah. she always had a desire to teach and I thought yeah it's interesting well hopefully he'll be joining the uh, profession in the not too distant who knows future, what that one's going to do <laughs> <laughs> I know which of my three is going to feed me in the old people's home though well I'll, uh, I'll write it on a piece of paper give it to you and you can show me in 60 years <laughs> but, Lisa uh, McKinnon thank, thank you oh, very thank much you. for your time it's been a wonderful discussion and, oh, and so much wisdom and let's just um, keep having these conversations about these beautiful young men because I think that um, you know we, we've, we've got to look after these these little souls they're gorgeous Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app and please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.